WBNE. Hi, I'm Carrie. And I'm Jade. And we're the Curly Critics, and today we're talking about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the movie. (laughs) I'm so excited! Jade, what's your history with this? Oh my gosh, I could go on and on and on forever. (laughs) It's not like 11 p.m., so we're really thriving today. Um... Just had coffee and a power nap. Really doing great. So, with this particular book, my grandma introduced this book slash movie. And this is probably one of the only series that I have ever watched the movie before reading the book. And I think it's okay to do so. And I can explain that a little bit later. But I was introduced to these movies as they were coming out because my grandma had a very Christian household, was like, no, we're just going to watch, like, Christian movies (laughs) or PBS or Cubo, if anyone knows what that is. Very throwback, old. (sighs) Pecola was a great show. Um, She would, to understand a little bit more of her, like, She would take me and my brother, we were little kids at the time, to the dollar movie where tickets were very cheap and I miss it more than anything. Rest in peace, (sighs) the dollar theater. (laughs) Oh my gosh, the last thing I saw there was Into the Woods and I'll never forgive myself for that. The last thing I saw there was the Charlie Brown movie. No, I'll never forgive you for that. (laughs) I saw that at the drive-in. Um, so we would go to the dollar movie and I mean, none of us had a lot of money at the time and she would pop entire bags of popcorn and bring entire sodas in her purse and have snacks for the movie and like smuggle them in. So if anyone's like, oh, you're such an upstanding citizen, Jade, the one law I will always break is I will always bring candy into the theater. 100% I will always do it because of my sweet grandmother who would never hurt a fly was just the most incredible woman but would always sneak food into the movie theater so she introduced us to these movies because they were some of the only movies we could watch like movies nowadays are kind of crude I don't know um and so we would watch Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe which is like a comfort movie for me now. It's like, if I could have a comfort food in movie form, it's this. I could watch this any day of the year. Um, they, one of my favorite Christmas presents was Prince Caspian on DVD. And then we got to see Don Treader after she passed away, which was sad. I was like, oh my gosh. That's not great, but it's okay. I even watched the original, I want to say, was it The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Or uh, The Guy and His Horse. That's not the right title for that. It's The Boy and His Horse, and I hope you're not asking me because I know nothing. (laughs) No, no, no. I just, there was like a BBC adaptation, and it was so boring. For me as a kid who grew up on this version it watching that was like oh my gosh this is like making a child watch a documentary (laughs) it was awful it was so boring we should rewatch those okay anyways what's your history on this carrie (laughs) so in my second grade sunday school class at church they read the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe book out to us, and I never remembered any of it. And so I read it later in life on my own, but I also didn't really remember it, but I had never seen these movies before, before a week ago. (laughs) (laughs) So like all things in my life in the last month, I started watching these movies because of Ben Barnes. But I was just sitting there with my roommates and I was like, oh yeah, I've never seen, actually seen a movie with Ben Barnes in it. And they were like, well, we have to watch Prince Caspian right now. And I was like, well, we can't do that until I've seen the first one. And they were like, good point. So we watched The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
And then we watched Prince Caspian the next day, and then we watched Don Treader two days later. So I watched all three in the last week, and now we're reviewing them on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I honestly feel like that's sensory overload. Yeah, I'm re-watching them before we record them, because it's just a lot. <laughs> yeah like everything just kind of gets mixed up you just get so caught up in the world that it doesn't matter what goes where as long as you know who's in it and about the world that's 100 percent what happened when i watched the lord of the ring movies for the first time oh yeah i watched all of those in one weekend and they're like three hours each I still haven't seen them. No one at me. Sorry, MC. Uh. Yeah, so I cannot tell you what happens in what Lord of the Ring book movie. They probably walk through a forest. There are hobbits. There are some talking trees. There's a ring. Talking trees. Hmm? Why did I sound like Yoda just then? What the heck? So this movie came out in 2005. My gosh. And it has Andrew Adamson as the director. Didn't know that. Don't know who that is. I always say the director, but I don't know who anybody is. (laughs) If you want to listen to a real movie podcast, (laughs) please listen Ah. to Bacon and Eggs. If you want to hear opinions, keep listening to us. <laughs> yeah, like us better. We love you. So, the movie starts with war. <laughs> Takes place in World War II. And we have the four... Penis... Pen, pen, how do you say their name? Pevensi. Pevensi. Pev- I'm sorry. Okay, Good I... Good lord. My whole life, I thought it was penisive. Or pensive. Which, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's hard to say. Yeah, it's hard to say in an American accent. That's why it took me a second. Because I was like, oh, just had a mini stroke. I don't... Pevensey. Okay. Yeah. So, we meet the four Pevensey kids. Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. I'm so proud. Names are hard, man. I Names almost got really it wrong. Hard. I had to pause before I started. And they live in London. And if you know anything about World War II, I had to look it up while I was watching it. But London's getting bombed. I knew that part. But London gets bombed. And there was part of a relocation program where they had kids and, like, pregnant mothers and, like, people who were unsafe in the city to be relocated somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so the siblings all go to this professor's house outside of London and they meet this professor or they don't meet the professor. The housekeeper's like, keep to yourself. Don't disturb the professor. Good luck. Bye. And they are sitting there. It's really boring in this old guy's house. And Lucy, the youngest, suggests that they play hide and seek and she ends up hiding in a wardrobe and falling into this magical snowy forest. Narnia. There she meets a fawn named Mr. Thomason. Mr. Tumnus. Tumnus. <laughs> <laughs> I can get some of the names right. And he introduces her to the world, tells her little bits of the things about how they don't have Christmas, how the White Witch is taking over, and then he tricks Lucy into falling asleep. Yeah. And tells her that the white witch is coming that anytime there's a human that comes into there they were supposed to tell the white witch because there's a prophecy about four children of adam who were going to come and save narnia from the white witch and so the white witch wants to stop them so mr tumnus helps lucy go back through the wardrobe and she returns to her siblings who don't believe her that narnia exists Yeah, no time has passed at all. Yeah. Which I am very curious to know what the relationship between is. Like, how much time passes in Narnia versus how much time passes in the real world. Oh, they talk about it in the book, I think. Yeah. This is, watching this movie, there are a lot of things, well, 
watching this movie made me want to read the book. Mm -hmm. And I mostly because there's a lot of things that get left out of the movie. Yeah, there are a lot of things that get left out, but they do a really good job of getting the main details down and getting the most interesting parts in. Which is important. I mean, the movie was two and a half hours long. They it had to so long. <laughs> they just had to get everything they could in, and I really appreciate that. Like, they're. I've read the books. Well, the three for the movies that I've watched. Don't at me. It's fine. And they do such a good job of just getting the important stuff in. Yeah, it's just the, like, first section, so we have Narnia, or Lucy going into Narnia, and then coming back, and then Edmund and Lucy going back to Narnia, and then coming back, and then they all go to Narnia, and mm -hmm. I'm sure that's exactly how it plays out in the books, but it takes 45 minutes before the story even actually begins. I didn't realize that. I'm in love with this movie, so <laughs> if we're gonna fight this whole time, that's okay. I would die for this movie. <laughs> I like this movie. So, like, Lucy comes back and tells her siblings that she went to this magical land, and nobody believes her, because they're like, oh, Lucy, you just have this crazy imagination. But then Lucy goes back that night, and Edmund follows her, and there Edmund meets the White Witch, who's like, bring me your siblings, like, I'll give you all of the Turkish delights that you want, which is one, the one detail I remember from the books. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the one detail everyone remembers. And then Lucy goes back to meet Mr. Tumnus, and then they re-meet, and they go back through the wardrobe to the professor's house, where Edmund lies and says that he hasn't been there. And Peter and Susan are like, oh, Lucy. And then, like, the next day, they accidentally break a glass like a window and so they're like hiding from the housekeeper and they all end up falling through the wardrobe mm -hmm. and then now they're all in Narnia and they all believe Lucy I feel like you could have cut out the first time Lucy went to Narnia and just had the part where her and Edmund go to get in together and had the exact same story happen Yeah. It just would have... No, you're definitely right. Like, thinking about it, she could have been hanging out with Tumnus while Edmund was hanging out with the witch, and then they would have gone back together. I don't know, they're just... It'd be hard to see a reason for Edmund to want to follow her because he's the worst and wants nothing to do with anybody. Yeah. You're going to hear a lot of Edmund hate on this podcast. From I don't I don't care I... what anyone says. Like everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, Edmund is such a mood." And I'm like, "Yeah, it's funny that he's like there's air inside. I get it. He's the worst. He's such a bully." I will not slander Edmund because oh I understand him. See, that's, that's what I mean. No. I... These angsty teenagers are just like, oh my gosh, the world is terrible. Like, no, have an imagination. I'm mad. <laughs> I'm glad you have a good relationship with your brother, Jade. <laughs> See, okay, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. I was watching this movie... The first time, and for the first 45 minutes where you're, like, going to Narnia and back and forth, it was painful to watch because the way Peter, Susan, and Edmund interact is exactly how I relate with my brothers. So if I was, like, I was Susan, oh. and my older brother's Peter, and my younger brother's Edmund, like, that is literally what it looked like growing up in our house. That hurts me. So I have a hard time being, like, Edmund's the worst because I watched my brother live and act exactly the same way that Edmund did and I'm not sure if we were in a situation where we ended up in Narnia and this like woman was like I'll give you whatever you want if you betray your siblings that my brother would have reacted any differently it's oh. the very much the younger brother complex in my experience I've not yeah. talked to other people that have younger brothers but like having 
two older siblings, one of which is a girl and one of which is a boy, is a lot of pressure on a younger sibling because you're like, because the girl just wants to be the mom and the older brother is resentful of the younger brother. Mm -hmm. And so there's just a lot of negative energy that goes towards the younger brother. And I did that. I was very much Susan in this. And so I get Edmund. He messed up. He makes up for it. But, like, I understand where he's coming from, and that's just how sibling relationships work. Yeah. So, yeah. He just, oh, he just bothers me. I don't know. Like, I don't have that relationship with my little brother. Like, we're weird. We're almost best friends, but we hate each other at the same time. It's amazing. It's really great. We call each other idiots. 100% of the time. It's a time. But, like, we also get to have those deep car ride conversations and we get to have conversations about life and it's really nice to get to talk to him one-on-one, even though I'm 21 and he's 16. Like, he has a lot to learn from me and I have a lot to learn from him. That kid is, he's going through an entirely different world than we did. And that's crazy to think about. But if he could be anyone in Narnia, he's more of a Peter than anyone else. I'm the same way, though. I think that's why we get into fights is because we're both loyal and protective of our people. And so, yeah. Also, just, like, big-headed and wants to run into battle. (laughs) Yeah, my relationship with my brother has gotten a lot better as, like, he's grown up. Mm -hmm. And, like, as I've, like, realized, become the most self-aware person in my family and been like, that's why this happened. (laughs) This is why we have conflict all the time. But, like, my brother and I now have, like, good conversations and good relationships. But teenage years were rough for my brother. Yeah. Especially, like... I matured at a much faster age than he did. I'm two years older than him, so yes. But also, like, my older brother is seven years older than me, nine years older than Tim. And so, like, Tim had to, like, grow up in this environment where I was maturing faster than him and Zach was already mature because there was Mm -hmm. such a big age gap. And so Tim was just always the little brother that we bullied. Oh. Yeah, I... I think my brother did grow up and mature well but I don't know it just wasn't that way like I know a lot of people who either don't talk to their siblings or they're not friends and we weren't friends for a while like my early teenage years and his like elementary years we fought constantly like all the time I hated him more than anything (laughs) But we naturally grew out of it. And, like, we're naturally best friends. We've had to learn to deal with each other. And I I don't take that for granted. Like, that's insane to me. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, my brother and I have grown out of our, like, awkward relationship. Even, like, my brother's relationship with my older brothers. Yeah. better now. And I think that's just part of growing up. I mean, like, Edmund grows out of it, too. Even by the end of this movie yeah he's a better person than how he started and then over oh, the yeah. next over the next two movies he becomes even better of a person oh yeah but, i hate him less and less so like, by the time the third movie comes around edmund is the king he's the one in charge and... oh yeah it's really cool to get to see him progress like that and go from this little kid who could be convinced by anything to no this is how things are gonna go i can hold my own Yeah, as opposed to Lucy, who I think gets more and more annoying as we go along. (laughs) No! Oh, no, that breaks my heart! Okay, to be fair, I haven't rewatched Prince Caspian and Don Treader in years, so I could have a not great opinion. I just, I think her character gets a little more sad to watch, like oh, I definitely relate to, like, when she's, oh, there's some, like, spell book or whatever, and she's like, Mm -hmm. oh, I want to be, I want to look like Susan, I want to be beautiful, and it's like, 
no, you're literally gorgeous. I can't deal with this right now. <laughs> like, I feel like that's how we were slash sometimes are. So it's hard to watch that as like a reflection of yourself going, no, you need to just like yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's in Don Treader. So we'll get to that when we get to yeah, that. Yeah, we'll get there. More positivity on the way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Lucy in this movie is very much the dreamer. Yeah. While Susan is very logical, like, I have to see it for myself. And Edmund is just angsty teen trying to figure out himself. While, like, Peter is trying to figure out his role as the oldest brother because their dad is off in war. Yeah. And so, like, they're all trying to figure out their place, except for Lucy. Lucy knows what she wants in this movie. (laughs) Lucy's like, I want to see the lion. I want to go to Narnia. (laughs) I love her. That's all Lucy wants, and it comes true. I mean, that's basically her whole character through all of them. Yeah. Every time they go to Narnia, Lucy wants to see Aslan and see Narnia. That's it. (laughs) Oh, man, I love her. She's awesome. So, the gang goes to Narnia, and they're... What happens? They're they're going to Narnia, and Lucy's like, let's go meet Mr. Thomason. Tumnus. Tumness. I'm never going to get that right. <laughs> <laughs> so they go and discover that his house has been, like, ripped apart. Because the White Witch found him. Yeah. And so then they start freaking out. And they're exploring and they run into a talking beaver. Which is, I've always said it, beavers aren't real. I've never seen a beaver in real life. And this just proves it, because if beavers aren't in Narnia, they can't exist in real life. Oh my gosh. I didn't realize I would have to jump on this train. I didn't think that was going to have to happen today. Like, we know birds aren't real. That's a whole nother thing. But, like, beavers. Okay, but then butterflies wouldn't be real, because there are butterflies. But they don't talk. And? It's a joke, Jade. (laughs) No, I want to jump on the train. I just... Listen, you gotta have good evidence for this. Like... The evidence is that I've never seen a beaver in real life. That's a problem. (laughs) I went to Beaver's Bend, Oklahoma, and there were no beavers. Well, that just makes sense. I also discovered it's not named after Beaver, it's it's named after a guy named Beaver. Oh, that- see, because I was like, I bet there's not even any rivers there. I betcha. Well, there are rivers. There are beavers there, they told me, but I've never seen them. Oh. Well, then you just don't have eyes. You don't have eyes. Shut up. (sighs) So, they go to these beavers who t- fills them in on, like, what's going on, that the white witch is here, that they need to stop her, and that those four are the ones in the prophecy that are going to save them. And then Edmund runs off, like the little jerk that he is, to go back to the white witch and is like, I brought my siblings here, and she goes full angry on him and is like, well, why aren't they here? And Edmund realizes that he made a terrible mistake. (laughs) And this is the point. (laughs) I'm just thinking of, like, the TikTok, like, voiceover. And this is the point where I knew I messed up. (laughs) And it's just him standing on the steps in the ice palace, like, freaking Elsa. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So then we get, like, a big chase scene kind of yeah. where the other three siblings are trying to go rescue Edmund but they're also trying to stay away from the Ice Queen's secret police because they're out to kill them she's like no we don't take prisoners we literally kill these people yeah and then they meet Santa Claus <laughs> yeah it's pretty dope and a weird turn of events yes so For your Dash and Lily reference of the day, they talk about how the weirdest part of Narnia is Santa giving Lucy a knife, which is fair. Oh my gosh, I forgot about that. It's a really weird part of it. 
don't look too much into it. <laughs> just a whole, a lot of this movie seems disconnected from itself. Mm. Like we go from scene to scene. We're in Narnia and then we meet these beavers and then we meet Santa Claus and then we're doing this thing. And it's all so magical and weird. Yeah. That it's like hard to take in at first. Yeah, I think And you're that's... like you're like running from the secret police and like, oh look, Santa? Yeah. I think that's what made it easier as a kid because everything was like Oh, remember the beaver scene? Remember the Santa scene? Like everything is so almost disjointed mm-hmm. that you know exactly what scene you're referencing every time. Like, when I asked you, oh, what about this scene where they're on the river? You were like, no, not that scene. Because you know exactly what part I'm talking about. So that made it easier as a kid. Does that make it a good movie as an adult? Less so. Yeah, there's also just a lot of exposition. Yeah, but in order to create a world right it's very it very much has the first book of a magical series type of feel where you're yeah. like i have to spend all of this time telling you about what's going on and then books from now on i won't have to do that again yeah like they just don't they're just like you better know what's happening <laughs> And, like, the books go into more details, like, ask that ex- answer questions that you had yeah. about the world. Like, where did the wardrobe come from? Like, all of these secrets about Narnia. Listen, I don't even know that much, honestly. <laughs> I know that because I looked it up. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on Google watching these movies. Oh, that's sad. You should have just enjoyed it. I have too many questions, Jade. Oh my gosh, you're such a Susan. (laughs) (laughs) I would have just read the books to answer my questions, but I'm working my way through the Six of Crows duology right now. Oh my gosh. Also, I don't have my books with me. They're at home. Enough of Six of Crows out of you. No. (laughs) Just leave it all to TikTok. (laughs) Enough. Someone's going to be really unhappy tomorrow. (laughs) Oh, that's right. It comes out tomorrow. We're filming the day before it comes out. The 22nd of April. Yeah, your life's probably going to be changed. It's fine. Super evil Ben Barnes. (laughs) I don't know if I'll be able to handle that. I just... (sighs) All right. So, Santa gives Lucy a knife, like a normal santa but also magic potion from the fire flower yeah so they all get like weapons that are like this is this is your destiny good luck peter gets a sword lucy gets a bone arrow and the horn which is and very important for later the horn of destiny yeah i would not have noticed that that was important if my roommates hadn't been like remember that's important for the next movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i would have been like Oh, it's a horn. That's nice. And then in the next movie, when Caspian, like, blew the horn, I would have not have even noticed. Yeah, you would have been like, where'd he get that from? What the heck? <laughs> You're like, oh, cool. He's trying to learn an instrument. That's nice of him. But then they're, like, running, and there's a scene on the river. Is that the next scene? Yeah, yeah. They're, like, there's a scene on the river where Peter becomes the big brother of everybody's dreams, and stabs the ice so that they can hold on when the water's because as since they've been in narnia the snow is starting to melt yeah so they're trying to cross this massive river and it's melting away because they're the ones that are going to defeat the ice queen yeah snow queen is it ice queen ice yeah ice witch white honestly yeah the white witch listen (laughs) As a child, when your name is part of the name of an evil person, it really does something to you psychologically. So the reason I am the way I am is because this lady's name is Jadis. (laughs) And that just really doesn't sit well with a small, innocent child. (laughs) It's fine. And then Lucy, like, 
falls off and like gets lost in the wizard okay this this scene made me so angry so lucy like falls off and like they think she drowned pretty much and susan immediately blames peter she's like this is your fault and i'm like he did believe lucy and kept going yeah but she's like i can't believe you did this and is like mad at him and i'm like calm down like you could have helped her too yeah she She, i get it because she the whole time is like we should turn back we should turn back and peter's like no let's keep going (laughs) yeah she has a lot of rage in this movie Mm -hmm. that does not need to be there (laughs) yeah and like i've done a lot of like googling about susan's character and so it makes sense yeah because she's very much the I just want to grow up and she's like the last one to believe in Narnia to the point where she doesn't believe in Narnia in the end. Mm-hmm. Spoiler. Ooh. Yeah. Sorry. It's been out for like a million years. It's fine. It's like the fifties. So <laughs> if you don't know the story of Narnia, figure it out. But she just is so angry all the time. And she's like constantly yelling at Peter and like constantly getting into fights. Yeah. Which is also like, I understand that relationship, but it's just very uncomfortable to watch. Yeah. Then they end up at Aslan's court. Mm-hmm. And Edmund escapes while this is happening. Or Edmund pleads his case and they let him free. Technically, they go rescue him. They do? Yeah, they find out where the evil people are stationed, and they go rescue him. I thought she just let him free. No. Oh. No, they I tie bet. him to a tree, remember? No. Oh my I gosh. I don't remember this at all. Yeah, they're like, in the- it's at night, and they're deep in the forest, and all these magical creatures are around, and everyone's evil- And so the Narnians find where Edmund is, get him out of where the tree is, and put the little dwarf guy in his place. And that's when they tie him up. Wow, I don't remember that at all. (laughs) It happened. I was- I was there. It's like- You were there? Yeah. Were you a Narnian? Yeah, I said hi to a Minotaur once or twice- Wow, that's blowing my mind. You don't believe me! Like, it happened! (laughs) I'm looking it up because I don't believe you, but also because I genuinely cannot remember that happening. Bro, this is why you should have paid attention. (laughs) This is the podcast where I call out Carrie for all of the things she should have done while watching Narnia, which is not be on her phone. I wasn't on my phone the entire time. Okay, so... Likely story. Before they meet Santa, she lets Mr. Tumnus out. Then they meet Santa, and then they do the woods. She lets him out, a.k.a. freezes him! Yeah. There's Edmund looking at... There's, like, a forest... Are you just scrolling hey, through Disney? Oh my god! They gosh. tied Edmund up to a tree. <laughs> Dude, that's so crazy. How did I, I miss you... that entire part? <laughs> Dude, I bet you were literally trying to figure out where they got the wardrobe from. Like... <laughs> that's a possibility. It is. Like, I don't... <laughs> but they... They go to Aslan's court, and then they save Edmund. Yeah. And they meet Aslan, and then they rescue him. My guy, Liam Neeson! (laughs) Then they, um, meet, and then they rescue Edmund, and then the witch shows up and is like, you can't do that, he's mine. And... She goes, all traitors, according to Narnia law, are my property, so you can't have him. Yeah, and if his blood isn't spilled, then this this land will be destroyed in 
like fire and ice, like everything will just get destroyed. And Aslan's like, well, you're not taking him. And she's like, okay. And so they go and talk and you're like, bro, what? Because <laughs> that's weird. And they all celebrate once it's over because it's like, oh, they're saving the kid's life. But... <laughs> But Aslan sacrifices himself. On lay stone table. And Lucy and Susan follow, even though Aslan told them not to. Yeah. And then Lucy's all sad. She's like, Aslan's dead. Yeah. And they go to battle after that. We're all sad against the witch and her, like, groupies. <laughs> And they're Which losing. they're far, yeah, they're far outnumbered. They're losing and everything's looking bad. And then all of a sudden, Aslan shows up. Well, he like comes back to life and is like, innocent blood is spilled on the table. They don't die. You're like, wow, convenient. <laughs> and then Aslan saves the day and they become the kings and queens of Narnia and stay there for 15 years before going back through the wardrobe and no time has passed. Yeah. And that's the movie. I really... It just... It was so fascinating to me watching as an adult the Christian parallels. Like, yeah... You have to kind of have an imagination. Everything's a metaphor, whatever. But the thought of the stone table cracking being the tearing of the veil was such a cool image to me. Like, that in itself. And, like, the women weeping at the grave and finding the tomb first and all this other stuff. It was like, whoa, this is crazy. That just... As an adult, it hits different, man. <laughs> yeah. It's just, like, Aslan's Jesus and all these, like, very, like, they're definitely there. Yeah, it's really cool, like, because as a kid, of course you don't really understand. Like, people can tell you, oh, this is this and this is this, and you're like, no, that's a lion, and these are some kids. But, like... When you start to see, I don't know, just the parallels of the kids in your life and the parallels of what happens in this story versus what's in the Bible, it's really cool to get to look at like, oh, this is really neat. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for C.S. Lewis for this story mm -hmm. that he's created and his just work in general. I also yeah. really love him. As a person, like, his biography and his life are some of the most entertaining. Him and Tolkien are, like, two of the most entertaining people that I've ever, like, read about. Mm-hmm. Also, the fact that they were friends. That's my mm. favorite piece of historical information that I ever knew. Incredible, yeah. And that Tolkien was influential in getting Lewis to become a Christian again, and then... Lewis was like, okay, I'll be a Christian, but I'm going to become Anglican, not Catholic like you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just so funny to me. It probably was because just because Lewis was baptized Anglican as, like, yeah. a baby. And that was probably the only reason. But, I like, part of me is, like, he did it because he didn't want to be the same. And it's he just wanted to be his own man. <laughs> to, like, look at them. Because they, like, compared notes and they were writing their books at the same time. And... To look at the stuff that they've written and be like, okay, so this is Lewis's response to this thing that Tolkien did and see that all play out. Yeah. And after watching all these movies, I really want to read the Narnia books. I never read them as a kid because I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I, my grandma gave me, she had her own copy, but she gave me a copy of Narnia, but it's all of the books in one book and it's heavier than a brick you can't yeah. carry it around it's very inconvenient i have a box set which is just all seven of them as individual books how nice <laughs> 
I started to read them, I think, in middle school, but mm-hmm. I started with The Magician's Nephew, because that's technically the first one in the series. Yeah. But it's hard to read if you don't have context. It's hard to start with, yeah. Because The Magician's Nephew is, like, the story of, like, how the wardrobe came to be. Yeah. Which is, like, cool. If if you read that and then read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and be like, well, I know where the wardrobe came from. But it also probably would have been better to read Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and then that one. Yeah. So, one day I'll try them again. Probably this summer <laughs> when yeah. I have time. Let's see, I did not look at my notes at all. Mm. I think it's really funny that Lucy keeps befriending older men that she probably shouldn't. Yeah, that was definitely problematic. Like, the scene with Tumnus, the older I get, the more uncomfortable I get watching that scene. And it happens in the next movie, too. Yeah. And I'm like, at the first movie, you're like, oh, it shows how innocent Lucy is. Like, that's so nice. But it keeps happening. And I'm like, Lucy, you know better than this. (laughs) Maybe she doesn't, but... She's still young in the second movie, like... Yeah, things were simpler back in the 40s and the 50s. Mmm, well... Yeah, technically only a year is supposed to pass between the first and the second movie, between Lion, the Witch, and the right. and Caspian. Right, but at the same time, they grew up to be adults. She does know better. Wait a minute! <laughs> Dang that it! That was weird. I have to admit, the fact that they lived... Like, me and my roommates talked about this a lot after we watched it. They, like, grew up 15 years and then just, like, went back to their older selves. Mm. And I'm not sure I would want to live two lives like that. Yeah. Like, mentally, it would probably be pretty cool. But it would be really... It would just be... Like, Lucy goes in. She's, like, eight. Yeah. She grows up 15 years. What is that? She goes to 23. And then she has to go back to her eight-year-old self body, and she has all of this knowledge of a 23-year-old, and then she yeah. has to re- just relive all of those years, on top of the fact that your body is going through all of those changes again. Yeah. That always fascinated me, for sure. I just... I don't know. It would be so different growing up in Narnia versus growing up here that it literally would be two separate lives. It's not like growing up in the UK and then growing up in South America. Like, it'd kind of be the same in a way. Mm -hmm. But because they're so different, because one is literally medieval and the other is (laughs) postmodern, like... It's such yeah. a drastic difference that I, I don't know, like, I kind of became okay with it. Yeah, I guess it's also, like, very much in, like, Susan and Peter especially. Like, Narnia's real, but it's also kind of like a dream. Mm-hmm. And so even, like, going into the next movie where they go back, it's kind of like, oh yeah, it actually is real. I didn't just dream that. Yeah, because they had to get used to their other lives again and then they had to get used to because they were already used to wartime and they had already gone away from home so they're like oh let's just have this adventure since we're already away from home and now they're like oh this is real life this is what we're doing oh wait no hold on oh my gosh yeah there's a lot going on yeah i think one of my favorite things about this movie that I've come to appreciate now is the child acting. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Literally all I could think about this movie was how well William Mosley, Peter, can act. Like, you can see on his face The entire movie that he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders. From the moment his mom says, hey, you have to take care of these kids, to Aslan saying, you have to lead these people into battle. You can see the weight of the world on his shoulders. You can see him going, 
I'm just a kid. How am I supposed to do all of this? Like, I'm not their parent. I'm not this great warrior. I'm no king. And it's like, oh my gosh. I'm really passionate about Peter. Okay. (laughs) Just also, Lucy's character. Oh my gosh. Or like, Georgie Henley. She's not bad of a child actor for being like 10 years old she's so incredible like her facial expressions are pretty good and like she plays like i mean she's 10 or 11 i forgot how old she actually was but Mm -hmm. she plays a very innocent like haha look at me kind of person yeah even edmund like you can see he's just the bratty kid who is just wants to get his way just doesn't want to be anyone else he wants to be himself do his own thing and you can see him kind of turning over to the dark side and then oh i did this awful thing and now he's on their side like all the changes he goes through in the movie all of them just do an incredible job yeah i think it helps that like narnia is rooted in a lot more reality than other things Mm -hmm. like thinking about the first harry potter movie The child acting in that movie, not great. But there's a lot more that you have to imagine in that one. Right. Like, here, you can hire kids and be like, okay, just act like you normally would. Like, I want you to do these things. And they're, like, just kids playing themselves, pretty much. And, like, it's like a fantasy world, but also, like, you could take everything that happens in Narnia into the present day, and the story would still make sense. Yeah. It also, I think there's something to say about how much Lucy cried in this movie. (laughs) Like, a crazy amount of times. And she did it so well. I think the one piece of acting that, that has always stuck with me is Peter's face when he thought Edmund was killed. Like, when Edmund was stabbed. His, just the devastation on his face. I was like, oh my god. Nope. Nope. I don't. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I don't like it. (laughs) But that's how incredible it is. And, oh, I've got to find it. I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. You need to watch the Narnia behind the scenes for each of the movies. Because, like, watching the behind the scenes of these characters and how... They're literally siblings on and off set. Like, they're best friends. Peter takes care of all of them. William takes care of all of them. It just, (laughs) like, ugh, it's so good. Like, they all take care of little Georgie, and I'm like, stop. It's too much for my heart. I love that. I know, they all just, they're literally, like, real-life siblings. Ugh. Also, this movie is beautiful. It really is. All of the colors and everything are very nice to look at. I also just like snow, and it's snowy for most of it, so that helps. But it's a very beautiful world that they've created with this set design and everything. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of it, like, more than I realized was CGI. Yeah, and the CGI is not that bad. There's only one part that I thought was kind of bad, and the rest was just phenomenal. Like, it was gorgeous. And, oh my gosh. Like, you have to watch the behind the scenes. All the, all the, um, fawns and centaurs and stuff in their green screen pants is really funny. (laughs) It's great. It's a great time. (laughs) Gonna do that. I have Friends Caspian on DVD. We can watch that one. <laughs> it's also on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> Not the behind the scenes, though. No, but that's probably on YouTube. Listen. The internet has changed everything. I'm not here for your negativity. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave. <laughs> Yikes. I was like, oh, extras. And then it was like another narnia movie on disney plus and i was like that's not extra that's dumb i was mad okay (laughs) yeah while we were watching this 
the Prince Casp or Pirates of the Caribbean movies kept popping up. And it's now become a running joke between all of my friends about how I haven't seen any movies. And so they kept talking about Pirates of the Caribbean, and they were like, oh yeah, this. And I was like, yeah, I have not seen that movie. <laughs> yeah, Which is why either. we watched these movies this weekend, because I had never seen them before. And aren't you glad you did? I did. Like, I think it's cool getting to experience another world like it's another it's another harry potter in a sense it's like this is narnia this is this comforting place harry like harry potter hogwarts in my opinion is very much to me it feels more like reality it feels like school it feels like oh if i went there i would just be learning more things doing more school okay magical things Yeah, but Narnia, it's like this medieval land, and it's not where reality is, and you've got this lion, and you've got talking animals, and you've got centaurs and fawns, so like, part Greek mythology a little bit, and so that's really cool too. I just have a special place in my heart for Narnia. No, I definitely get it. Narnia to me feels like reality that they made magical. Yeah. While Harry Potter is like, reality that is magical yeah like but they both are like very much different worlds and like very escape home places yeah yeah like i would much rather if i had a choice i would much rather go to narnia than hogwarts yeah i I like Narnia. I don't love medieval things as much. Oh, yeah. Narnia definitely got me into medieval things. So, so like, that's a like a downside to it. Mm-hmm. I just can't get behind the lack of modern amenities in medieval times. That is definitely a fair point. But, like, I can see the beauty and the grasp of Narnia. Mm-hmm. It just also was not a part of my growing up life at all. Yeah. Well, like, Harry Potter was only part of my life from, like, 8th grade on, but yeah, it was there earlier than Arnia was. So what but you're I- saying is we just need to go to Camp Half-Blood. Uh-huh. That's, like, reality that's magical, but also I'm not unconvinced it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Can't tell me otherwise. Sorry. You told me that demigods were real. I would be like, yeah, you're right. (laughs) Definitely 100%. Because that is just magic living among us. That's the difference. Narnia is magic in medieval times. Or it's like reality made magical. Yeah. Harry Potter is magical reality. But you're still going to another place. But Camp Half-Blood is literally just in new york yeah yeah you like go to narnia you go to hogwarts even though hogwarts is still like in england yeah but it's still it still feels like an escape yeah camp half blood doesn't feel like an escape it just feels like a coping mechanism to deal with the world you're already in which is very deep oh my gosh <laughs> We're having a lot of self-discovery today. I had therapy today, so that definitely (laughs) didn't hurt. Yeah, I love magical worlds, and I love that now I have another one to add to my arsenal. (laughs) Yeah, because it's not necessarily a... Well, Camp Half-Blood is not necessarily a magical world. It's just the world we're in with a little bit of mist sprinkled in. Uh, But, yeah, you get to add Narnia to that list, and it's it's one of those things where it's like, dude, welcome to this world. It's really fun. It's not one of those, like, oh, well, you're not a real fan because you don't know about the Marauders. (laughs) Yeah, uh, Narnia is definitely a beloved story that's old enough that it missed a lot of gatekeeping. Yeah, and that, I... Like, it doesn't... It doesn't have a huge fandom culture around it. Like, there are fans, but it's not, like, fandom culture. So you can just love Narnia in any way that you want to and not have to worry about people telling you you're wrong. Yeah, I feel like 
I I haven't read a whole lot of Narnia fan fictions to be honest, but I would imagine most of them are just really wholesome. Like the Pinterest posts I've seen, like all that stuff, they're just wholesome. It's just good. That's why it's like comfort food, comfort movie. It's like it there isn't gatekeeping. There isn't a lot of, "Oh, well, you're not a real fan if you don't know." Nah, 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 nah. Like who cares? Nah, just it doesn't matter if you've just seen the movies, if you've just read the books, if you did both, if you've watched every single adaptation, which kudos, because that's hard. <laughs> like, it's just, if you're just here for Ben Barnes. Not me. No. <laughs> See you. Never. Came for Ben Barnes, stained for William Mosley. <laughs> I need that on a t-shirt. No, you need that on a t-shirt. I need... I loved Ben Barnes before it was cool on a t-shirt. I just need, like, I came here for Ben Barnes and then it's like a fill in the blank. Because that's where my <laughs> life is at currently. <laughs> oh my gosh. Literally. I love how much we've talked about Ben Barnes and he's not even in this he's movie. Not... <sighs> he's not... All right. Just... What do you think the Rotten Tomato critic and audience scores are? Oh my gosh. For this movie? Oh, yes. crap. I keep losing my hat. I would say critic score... Uh, I'm gonna say like 77 because it's whatever. And then audience, like 85. Okay, I'm gonna say... 75 critic, 80 audience. So, like, the same. Okay. There is no audience score. <laughs> what? It's I'm rating it soon. a 100. That's it. It has a 76% critic score, though. Bro, literally right in the middle. That's sweet. That's good for them. They knew. <laughs> yeah. So what do you give this? Okay, I did think about this beforehand. You're going to think I didn't because I'm still stalling, but I did think about it. Um, so I'm not going to be fully objective. I'm usually not, so. No, you're, you're allowed not to be. That's why we do the, like thing where my score is weighted higher because you've seen it before to try and outweigh the nostalgia factor yeah because it's i think the child acting and the prettiness of the movie alone gives it a seven that's not my score please hold <laughs> i just think that alone does it like that does it for me um i'm gonna give it an eight and a half because it's not my favorite but I think it's still a great movie. I guess you were going to give it a nine. <laughs> hey, I couldn't go that high. I was like, no, I can't. I'm going to give it a seven and a half. That's fair. Because I liked it. I thought it was pretty. I liked the other two afterwards better. So yeah. we'll get to that when we get to that. But I th oh, this movie is so long. Yeah. It's obnoxious. I think... I was thinking about it. I think I don't remember that scene with Edmund because it's so far into the movie that I checked out. <laughs> See, but. I didn't... I never checked out. Even as a kid, it held my attention. So that's really weird. <laughs> well, I also think technology is ruining our brains and my attention span is slowly dwindling every day. <sighs> but <laughs> it's just... A lot. I knew how the story was going to end up, and it's just long. There's a lot of exposition, but it's pretty, and I like the characters and the acting and the story and everything. So, so for your own personal benefit, you gave it a 0.5. <laughs> you gave it a 0.5 too. I gave it a 1.5. Because I said oh. the acting and prettiness alone oh, yeah, gives yeah, yeah, it a 7. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. See? Yeah. I thought you just meant that I gave it a 7.5 and so like, because you like to make fun of me for giving it decimal points. 
No. It was when okay. you did like a point six that I got mad. I've done that multiple times. I hate it. <laughs> I'm going to continue. See, listen, to all you people out there who have their, like, volumes at, like, 2 or 10 or 16 or 15, depending on how the numbering system works, you get me. You understand. It's fine. I do my volumes by multiples of three. You psycho. Take that with what you will. So, I have- there's a reasonable explanation for it, if you want to hear it. I doubt it. <laughs> okay, one, threes are funner to count by than twos and fives. No. Also, two, like, turning up your volume by twos is not enough sometimes, and turning up by fives is too much. So threes are the happy medium. No, I just do it by how much I can hear. Because I'm nine is a better number than ten, so obviously you want to pick nine instead of ten. Nine is better than. So together we gave this movie a seven point eight three. I'm really mad. I'm moving on. Ugh. Okay, no, we need to talk about this before before this episode's over because I didn't bring it up naturally. It's fine. So. On their way to the professor's house, the children ride a train. Yes. As some of you may know, I'm obsessed with trains. Not in like a, I know all the names of trains or anything. Just in like a, I was definitely one of those kids who watched Thomas the Tank Engine as a kid. Like... I rode Thomas the Tank Engine because that was a thing back in the day. We rode the Polar Express on our first grade field trip, which 12 out of 10 would recommend. I just love- That was first grade? That was first grade, my guy. We were wow. in our pajamas. We met freaking Santa and had bells and everything. Oh man. Like, we got to literally do the hot chocolate scene. I just- Oh my gosh. It's so good. Okay. Good um, point. <laughs> my point is I love riding trains so as a topic of conversation is there a movie like is there a good movie without trains that's the thing like in the Star Wars universe there are space trains in Harry Potter obviously train Narnia train like there are no trains in the Martian. So is it a good movie then? Yes! <laughs> Listen, there's also not a train in Die Hard. That's not a good movie, so... Shut up! Listen, no. There is a subway in Dash and Lily makes it a good series. So anything that takes place in New York has to be good because it has a train in it. Because yeah. there's subways in New York. Like, Percy Jackson? Good. Trains. So what you're saying is that we have to start ranking things based on how many trains are in it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Sounds great. I should tweet this. <laughs> Name a good movie that doesn't have trains in it? You can't, because only the best movies have trains in them. Okay, do you want to close this out, Jade? I would love to. I just think it's a really good tribute to Ethan. <laughs> Ethan and Tyler are forefathers. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a test to see if you're listening. Okay. Um, we have social media. I'm going to tweet about trains later. Or earlier, depending on when you're listening to this. Ooh, fancy. Um, at Curly Critics Pod. We also have an Instagram. Same tag. Uh, we have a Gmail. Gmail us, because it's fun. Uh, CurlyCriticsPod at gmail.com. I obviously haven't made a Facebook yet. We all know that. We all know. Um, social media. <sighs> We're on, like, Spotify and Apple and stuff. <laughs> like our podcast is. I guess individually we are, too. 
Yeah, okay, but, like, I also have, like, a singing thing on there, so that's kind of cool. So it has to be differentiated, okay? Okay. <laughs> the Curly Critics are a proud member of the wb Network. The network has eight great shows to listen to and enjoy, one of which is the original Bacon and Eggs, where Tyler and Ethan talk about movies, and they're amazing. We like to call them our forefathers or the not Curly Critics. The not Curly Critics. Okay, here's a promo. Howdy, Yokes. I'm Tyler Carlin. And I'm Ethan Edge Hill. And we host Bacon and Eggs, a movie lovers podcast. It's the most roll your eyes, I've seen it before concept for a show. But with new hosts, I promise. Each week, we sit down together and watch a beloved movie. We start by looking at some critical and concrete points and let our conversation flow from there. We've covered all sorts of movies, from Jaws to Little Women. From the Lego Movie to the Lego Movie 2. From Marvel to Star Wars. From Back to the Future to Back to the Future Part 2. And tangents from our frustrations with fast food. To discussing our fear of the Mighty Loom. So if you want a podcast that makes you laugh, download Bacon and Eggs, a movie lover's podcast. With new episodes available every Thursday, wherever you get your podcasts, and now on WBNE.org. Ghostbusters 2! I, I, my, my hope and dream was that you would say that. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash curlycriticspod. We have four tiers, ranging from $3 to $15, where you can become our pen pal, listen to our bonus show, or join our Discord, where you can talk to us every single day. Thank you for listening, and we hope you all have a magical Monday. Magical because it's from Narnia. Bye! Bye!